Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming here today. Um, it is a true pleasure for me to welcome you to the first of IIIT Bangalore's public lecture series, Bangalore on IT. Bangalore on IT is an initiative by the Branding Committee of 2018. We believe that informed and up-to-date students and researchers can bring about greater change through the dissemination of information via lectures by leading scholars and thinkers on all topics related to IT. We hope that via these lectures, we can foster an environment of greater learning and collaboration. I welcome our speaker, Dr. Marianne Schmidt-Mast and her team, the Director, Deans and Registrar of IIIT Bangalore, faculty, students and all of our participants. I'd like to invite the Director to say a few words. Good morning. Special welcome to Professor Marianne, who has come all the way from Switzerland. And she's first visit to Bangalore, a special thanks. I had to the pleasure of spending a few minutes with her. So nice. And of course, thanks to Dinesh for ensuring that she's here. And uh, so just about uh, two minutes, a little bit about the backdrop. So we were born in 1999 as an institute. And we are an IT only focused institute. And then we are in Bangalore. And of course, over the years, we also realize that IT starts to impact whole humanity. So the larger impact of IT, the location in Bangalore, and the fact that we are an IT-focused institute, so we thought that we should do something to kind of take this message to beyond our students. So in 2003, Many of the civil society folks in Bangalore, they said, look, you should do something, okay? You should do something beyond running the institute. So we actually started a lecture series called Bangalore on IT. And our students quickly made it into Bang on IT, because that became a nice stuff. We ran some 50 lectures, okay, in the city center. And we had some very fairly committed audience. About 40 of the people were coming regularly, but after 50, we got a little tired, okay? And then we also, the institute was growing at that time. We were just about five, six faculty members. So we said, maybe we'll relaunch when we are across 50. We are close to that. We are just about 50 faculty members now. So we are kind of relaunching it. And Professor Marian has the special, special honor that you are giving the first ever lecture of this lecture series. And we do hope to see you maybe again in some time in future. It's not that you can give multiple times. And uh, I think uh, we had put it out. You know, we have a small group of couple of people who manage our uh, social media, which we don't understand well. So we realize that only people who are sub 30, less than 30, should mod do that. Otherwise, we don't understand that. So they manage this. And uh, they told me that about 40 people have registered from outside. So those of you who have come from outside of Triple TV, at least I could see about several of them. So special welcome to you. More than anything else, you have braved the Bangalore traffic, that too, a traffic to Electronic City, which has become notorious in the last four weeks. I understand for four more weeks, we have to suffer through a special thanks. And over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dinesh. I'm an assistant professor here at IIIT Bangalore. And it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Marianne, uh, with whom I had a chance to collaborate uh, during my doctoral studies. Uh, professor, professor Marianne is a full professor of organizational behavior at HEC at the University of Lausanne. After her PhD in psychology from University of Zurich, she pursued her research at Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, she held positions as assistant professor in social psychology at University of Freiburg and New Chattel. Uh, her research interests addresses how individuals in power hierarchies interact, perceive, and communicate, how first impressions affect interpersonal interactions and evaluations, how people form accurate impression of others, and how physician communication affects patient outcomes. She uses immersive virtual environment technology to investigate interpersonal behavior 
and communication as well as computer based automatic sensing to analyze non verbal behavior in social interaction so it's a very long uh, list so i'll just shorten and say one final uh, sentence so in 2008 she has been named one of the 50 most influential uh, living psychologists so we are very happy <laughs> and uh, proud to have her inaugurate the uh, public lecture series over to you professor maria Thank you so very much for having me. This is a great pleasure and a special honor, obviously, to be here and uh, restart the lecture series. Thank you so much, uh, the director of the Institute. Thank you so much, Dinesh, for inviting me. And thank you, all the tech team already, and the media team, and all the people that were helping uh, a little bit more behind the scenes. So I'm very happy to be here and honored. I'm going to talk about how we can use virtual reality for the study and for training of social interaction. So here is my background. I'm a psychologist by training. So I'm not doing the programming, and um, all of you, I'm sure, are more apt to do that than we actually are. You'll see the quality of our uh, uh, programming. But I'm going to say that my specialty really is to find out how people interact with avatars and how we can use the technology and why we, in my view, should use the technology to study social interaction. So that's um, the content of my talk, which will probably come up real quickly. And, um, I probably don't have to, well, let me say something about how this is going to be run today. So I'm going to give the talk and then uh, we have a little demo for you. Not everybody will be able to uh, join the demo, but uh, for those who are really curious, uh, please then just queue up and I'll be outside for further questions. But there's also going to be a little space for questions. So here we go. Uh, I just said that. What my specialty is, my expertise, is social interactions at work. So we're looking at typical scenarios like the job interview or giving negative feedback to a collaborator. A very stressful situation for managers is when they have to fire a collaborator. So how can we train them to do that? How can we train them to overcome stress? How can we train them also in terms of verbal and nonverbal behavior? And uh, here is a little definition, what I understand by interpersonal behavior, which is exactly what I just said. It's the verbal and the nonverbal aspects of this interaction. Now, this is the question I'm asking today. How can virtual reality come into play for that? And um, as you can see, we have uh, uh, the, the setup here. So we are typically working, but not exclusively, with immersive virtual reality. Uh, this one is a walking virtual reality, so you don't use a, a, um, a remote control to, um, to be able to move in the world, but you actually uh, use your own legs to move. Um, you can interact with the virtual humans, which is exactly the part that I'm interested in. So we are using um, virtual humans that have been programmed. The virtual humans, as you know, they can do sort of the same things. They can, and that's maybe the two very important parts for social interaction. They, we pre-record the human voice, and then they, and then what's really important is also the eye contact, because that uh, gives this uh, connection that we need. All right, here's just a little demo how this looks in terms of also quality of our avatars. Um, this is from a virtual job interview. So here the situation is that the student uh, sits or the applicant sits in front of the computer and then launches the demo. This is a virtual recruiter asking an interview question. Then the person responds to the question and is filmed. So we have little snippets of video that show what the person was doing. And then afterwards, you can watch those. You can share it with your coach. And then obviously, what we are also interested in developing more and where you have the expertise is then automatic analysis of the cues that people are using and then um, give them feedback automatically, which is not implemented right now. So I'm very much still being the psychologist, thinking that at one point, so far as I see where the technology is, and we can talk about that some more, um, we need a human expert in the chain somewhere. 
So here is uh, how this looks like. Well, I'd like to ask why you were searching for a new job opportunity, and why you chose to apply for the position of and then you would just say like, okay, this is uh, why I'm applying and so on, you're videotaped and then you can analyze the video. Now I'm going to talk about two aspects of uh, this kind of settings, which is why we, I use it, I've been using it for the, actually the past 15 years uh, in research and then more lately also in training. So here are the three main advantages in my view that um, the use of virtual reality for uh, the study of social interaction has. And I'm gonna go through each of them also with a research example so that you can have a little bit of a feeling of in terms of content, what am I actually looking at, not just in terms of methodology. So here's the first one, standardization. What do I mean by that? Well, it means that when I smile, Typically, you smile too. So there is something going on in the interaction, and that's exactly, that's perfect. But for some situations in life, we don't necessarily want that. So think about a, a recruitment situation where I want to know whether this candidate and that candidate and you, how are you different? Now, if I, for whatever reason, connect more with you, I smile more, you're going to smile more. So you're going to show a different behavior just because I do something different with you. So what I then observe is maybe not very objective or very informative of who you are, but it's brought about by me. And this is obviously in the job context, maybe problematic. So here is an example how relatively subtle such a mechanism can work. So imagine that your expectations for, let's say, a new professor, you might have in mind uh, somebody like this. So, and this is your pool of applicants. So if you don't question your implicit expectations, you might be more likely to hire these people. Now, um, here is another illustration. Imagine that these are your two job candidates and you have, for whatever reason, some expectations maybe based on gender about these people. He would be more rational and she would be more emotional. Now you ask a question about how they manage their teams because that's important. And then she gets a question posed like this. How, how do you manage your teams so that the collaborators maintain good relationships to achieve good results in challenging um, projects? Fair question. Now you ask him sort of the same question, but not quite. Instead of maintaining the good relationship, it's remaining focused on the task. So what is happening? By the way you ask the question, this person here will talk a lot about achieved task and how they're gonna be focused on the task, whereas she is sort of forced to talk more about social relationships. Now, later on, week laughter, you deliberate about the candidates and you, somebody will say, well, I don't know. She talked an awfully lot about um, the relationships, so I'm not sure whether Somebody else's uh, thing is on it? Okay. Um, so I'm not sure whether there's a problem in relationships for her. And he was really focusing on the project, on the research, and that, that's exactly what we need. And what you forget is that actually it was your question that brought about that behavior. So this is what we call self-fulfilling prophecy, which is your expectations affect the way you ask the question or also your nonverbal behavior, which then, then brings about a specific nonverbal or verbal behavior in the other person, which then confirms what you actually were thinking all along. Now here is a, a research in which uh, we uh, used the standardization that was important. So we have a, a recruitment panel of two people, virtual. And the participant here is presenting him or herself for a job interview. Now what we did is uh, we randomly assigned the participants to one of two conditions. Either before they went into the job interview, either we told them, think about a situation in which you have power in your life and write about it. Or there was a control group, they had to write about what they did the day before. 
And then they went into the interview, we filmed them in the interview, and uh, expert coders coded how hireable, likelihood of being hired, uh, these people were. Here are the results. What you can see is that for those who were in the condition of thinking about power, they were actually doing better during the job interview. Why was that? Because they reported to, having, uh, to feel more powerful, and then that affected sort of their nonverbal behavior. So they were less stressed, and that impacted on what they did nonverbally. So they were, there was less fidgeting, there were less uh, signals of stress, which made a positive impression on the people watching and uh, judging their hireability. <clears throat> so here is the take home message in terms of the research. Uh, next time you're confronted with a social evaluation uh, situation, like a job interview or oral exam, a good strategy would be to think about a situation in your life in which you have power. But do that before you go into the job interview, not during, because that's going to be cognitive load. That's not what you should do. All right. Now, let's move on to the next um, uh, um, advantage, logistics and costs. Uh, imagine you want to train to give a talk in front of this audience. So uh, if you want to do that for one person, that's fine. But if you have 100 participants and each time you have to uh, invite all of you just to listen to multiple versions of the talk, obviously that's not going to happen so easily. So um, people obviously are available, virtual people are available 24-7. Um, They're not complaining if it's not interesting. They're always reacting the same way. So that's another standardization thing. Now here is the research that we did um, that shows you the advantage of not having to uh, uh, solicitate a real audience each time. We know from research that there's a gender difference in terms of uh, public speaking. So women, when they're given the opportunity to talk in front of other people, they take less time. And men, they speak more. Why? We don't discuss that now, but that's just a finding that has been uh, shown several times. Now, we were wondering, is there a way we can empower the women? Is there a way we can make this gender difference go away? Because public speaking is an important part of many managerial and leadership tasks. And as women progress towards, uh, you know, more responsible leadership positions, it's important that um, we, we understand how we can I don't like this word help, but you know, how, how we can empower them. So here was our idea. We were wondering, can role models play a role? And so we had four conditions. And again, people were randomly assigned to the conditions. This is the neutral condition. They just gave a talk in front of this audience. That was a persuasive talk. talk and we measured essentially the time they spent trying to persuade the audience. Now here is the male role model. Now we can debate about whether that's a good role model or not, but that's the thing that we used in a Swiss context. And then we also had to have a female role model. Again, not everybody likes the Clintons and stuff, but that's what we used. And uh, since the reviewers had some issues with these uh, Clinton stimuli, we also added a fourth condition with Angela Merkel, and this all was done in a Swiss context. Now we simply measured speaking time, and here are the results. So if there was no picture, that's what we already know from literature. So men, as you can see, speak more than women. It actually doesn't change when there is a male role model up there. Uh, same results, but it changes. Two things change when there is a woman as a role model. One is the gender difference goes away, and women, in comparison to these two conditions, they significantly talk more. So in this case, 24, in this case, 50% uh, more speaking time. So here is the take home message. If uh, you are confronted with, uh, as a woman, with a leadership task, well, get yourself a successful role model sort of handy. That's going to empower you. And if you are a successful female role model, trying to get visibility because it's really important. You can inspire many other women with your just being there and being exposed and having visibility. I come to the third point that is very 
fascinating for me in terms of using virtual reality for research. And as you have understood, I think, until now, is that most of my research has an experimental approach, so different conditions, and then look at outcomes. This is a question that we were asking. We were wondering, um, well, does the environment in which I interact with my subordinates as a leader affect how I talk to them? Does it affect my leadership style, my communication style? And we had two conditions in this uh, particular study, and I show you uh, the first one. So she is in a very high status office. Uh, we don't really need the sound here. So she's looking around, wonderful view. She has a bay view also. We understand that's on the upper floor. Um, and she even has a secretary who's taking the appointment, sort of the gatekeeper uh, before uh, other people come in. And now she's going to talk to her subordinates. So the story is this is one of your subordinates having uh, underperformed in the past. And you need to give her a pep talk, a motivational talk. So she comes there. And then here would start the pep talk. And we would film people. And then again, external raters would rate um, the, the type or the, the, the style of uh, how they communicate. So this is one condition, and then in the other condition, you're gonna see it's the same office. The only thing that changes is actually the view. So now we are on the ground floor, more or less. There's no bay window, and as you might guess, there's no, bless you, there's no secretary. So it's clearly a lower status position, but the, the office is the same, and we're just looking at does it change how people speak. Here are some preliminary results. So what I can see is for the women, it doesn't make a difference. You can basically put women wherever, you know. <laughs> Should you? I don't know, but that's the result. Anyway, but interestingly for the men, it makes a difference in the sense that if they are in a high status office, and this is the, uh, one of the variables that we measured, how charismatic and competent were they perceived just by external uh, viewers, that weren't obviously aware of the condition in, in, in which they were. So, you know, maybe for, um, I'm not, I'm not going to give really this advice, but if you take this seriously, this is more or less what it want, means. If you want a male leader to be charismatic, give him a posh office, right? All right. So uh, I, I wouldn't advertise that as a policy, but just as an interpretation of, uh, of the results. So you can clearly see, I guess, um, how the manipulation was really, I mean, doable in virtual reality and almost impossible to do in the real world. So I think this is really the power of the, so these three things are the main power of the method. Now, let me switch gears a little bit and talk about training. So I've, I've told you 15 years of research in virtual reality and um, relatively lately, three, four years, I've become more interested in uh, all that is training. So here are a couple of advantages that I see uh, for training. And I'm going to go again through them all. So ease of access to training partner, I think this is the one that we already saw. Um, again, you have a big audience, uh, so it's just convenient to have them there. Now the second point is what I like to call double reality. What is that? So in, let me back up, um, virtual reality has been used a lot in clinical psychology for, uh, in terms of a therapy. Now, uh, this is called virtual reality exposure training. How does that work? So this is an example from a colleague of mine, Joanne Defiti uh, in New York. She's working with uh, soldiers coming back from uh, uh, from, from one of those wars uh, the U.S. is involved, and um, they have post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, one, there's different therapies, and she was experimenting with uh, people who were resistant to, uh, to, to um, typical treatment. So she put them in virtual reality. They, 
they uh, developed a scenario that was very close to what they were living in Iraq and uh, would accompany these uh, soldiers by living through their experiences again. So the idea behind exposure theory is that anything that you're afraid of, you can only overcome this anxiety by getting exposed to it, but in a controlled way. So you have the stimulus, let's say a spider, you're afraid of spiders, so the first thing is you just look at the picture of a spider, uh, and, and then you go a step further until finally uh, sort of touching the spider and uh, making the experience that it's actually not deadly, you're going to survive, and so on. And it's the same for what I'm interested in, which is training. So the mechanism is exactly the same, except that we're not working with a clinical population. So you're afraid of public speaking. The only way to overcome it is to learn that step by step, you know, you're not going to die. It's probably going to be fine and interesting and everything. So this is the mechanism that we are using. And virtual reality is a wonderful intermediate step. Why is that? Because it's this double reality. You sort of know these people are not real. They're not really judging me because they're just avatars. But you still feel the little stress because they are looking at you. And they are following, so in the in simulation, they are following you with their eyes, uh, sort of really interested in what you're saying. And um, so in that sense, it, this is a really powerful method. It, uh, I think it accelerates the, the, the learning or the, 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 yeah, the integration process. New ways of providing feedback. That's another uh, interesting part. So here is the example. This uh, person is talking in front of an audience. Uh, so it's a, like a meeting. And um, we don't need the sound. You can see here's a, pic here's a person taking a picture. So obviously it's going fine, sort of like you guys are doing. That's very encouraging for public speaking. But, and please don't do that, there is a person who just left the room. So if you're teaching, you know, uh, this is always a little stressful. If one person is leaving, okay, maybe there was an urgent need to leave the room. But imagine that slowly everybody is leaving the room. I mean, that's just completely stressful for everybody. And we can we can induce that stress. We have other means to do that. Here is a person uh, uh, taking notes on her laptop. So again, it's an ambiguous signal. We don't know whether it's so interesting or whether it's so boring that she's checking email. And then here, some people are talking, but they just stop. But uh, once in a while, they're talking on the side. And you actually also hear that. And that's very disturbing. And so there are two things we can do with this. We can well, increase or decrease stress. We can also have people, here they're following you really attentively, but we can have them sort of get, you know, distracted, sort of yawning and looking at the watch, that kind of thing, which is really stressful. So we can work with that, or we can use it as a direct feedback from the audience. So in typical training, what you do in social skills training, you provide role models, good and bad, and then you practice. And then based on the practice, you afterwards get feedback. Now, what is different here is you get immediate feedback because the trainer can just, as a function of the quality of the talk, have these people react to your talk. So that's a very interesting uh, uh, application. And obviously, there are also applications out there uh, who track then the behavior automatically and feed that information back to the uh, um, to the audience, and the audience reacts sort of automatically to that. I have a word to say about all of these um, sort of automatic uh, extraction of social cues and then uh, triggering some sort of uh, feedback um, in, in any form. So as I know, and we have done uh, research, well, he has done the research on, <laughs> Dinesh has done the research on the computer part. So it's not so, as you know, it's not such uh, so difficult to extract actually the signals, like where the person is uh, watching. So you have a video and an algorithm can relatively easily and with uh, great accuracy extract some of that information. Um, the tricky part is the psychology part behind it because, okay, we know that the person smiled like five times in a job interview. Good. What does that mean? Well, I don't know. We need to look at the research. How many times 
smiling in a job interview is good. Should you program your algorithm to say like, yeah, it's good, you should hire that person uh, starting from three smiles? I don't know. Our research shows, for instance, that in terms of smiling, it is good if you smile at the beginning of the job interview because that's when the social interaction uh, is taking place and at the end. Uh, because again, that's where the social interaction takes place, but not so much in the middle. But then it also depends on the job. If you recruit for a sales job, then you're supposed to smile more than when you recruit for a high uh, responsibility leadership job. Uh, and, and all of that, I don't see it, at least right now, not integrated in those algorithms. Partly because there is maybe lack of collaboration between, uh, um, let's say, uh, social science and uh, computer science. But then also because we are lacking, so the, the social science doesn't always have those responses. We also need to still do the research uh, first. All right, I'll go on. My last point, and that's my favorite one, is I think, well, Maybe you can convince me of something else, but my, I, I, I feel that the potential of the virtual reality is maybe not so much in what the definition of virtual reality actually says, which is you copy the reality but in virtual. In my view, the real potential is where you can have people live or experience something they cannot do in the real world. So, for instance, we have an, a, a, a simulation where you can give the people the impression that they fly. So, you, all of a sudden, you're a superman or a superwoman. And that's a very strange feeling. You can't really have that in real life. Now, if you ask me, how do you do that? How do you use that for research? I'm not completely sure. I haven't done it. But you could also think of a sort of a priming experiment where you give power to the people because they fly and everything, you know, is so small down there. So that could be one of the applications. Then there is other things and I'm going to show you what we are using uh, actually. So here is a public speaking scenario, but um, this is a little strange, right? So there is a big void uh, in front of the public. So here, that's what actually what we are using for training of public speaking. So you see in the other scenarios, but this one is very powerful because we add a, an additional stress that is unrelated to the stress of public speaking, which is fear of heights. So your body has those signals and these physiological reactions of fear of height during that situation, and then that's when we train you. Sort of like the exposure uh, therapy, so we train you to overcome that fear, to master that fear. We do uh, breathing exercises, we do nonverbal training, and that's what I'm gonna demo for you and for everybody who wants to try it out today. And uh, it's very powerful because also it can teach you strategies to overcome stress. Because again, you feel, oh my God, um, you know, why? I know that there is no hole, I can't fall, but I'm still feeling it. So how can I make myself go on the plank, sorry, go on the plank and talk to these people? I actually know I can do it, but, but my body says something else. And then you develop some strategy, which is then once you get out of virtual reality, sort of piece of cake, because you have developed some strategies and you don't have the additional fear of falling. So it becomes easier to present uh, in front of the public. And this is what we use actually in training. So I give a class uh, for students, for master students, where we do a part of it in the virtual reality lab where we train them for public speaking. I also do that for executive education. This is a workshop, a one day workshop, very classical. First we, uh, we talk about structure and, and metaphors and all of that. And then we go into virtual reality and do the nonverbal part and the stress mastery task with, with that scenario. Another thing that I'm very interested in using also for the research is another thing you can't do in real life is interact with yourself. You can't meet yourself as a sort of an independent person. So the doppelganger, the definition is that this is an avatar that looks like you but behaves independently of you. So it's not like watching into the mirror or seeing a video of yourself because on a video, 
there's also progress happening, but up until now, usually what you see in the video is things that you have actually done. Now, that's different for the avatar. You can have the avatar do anything. Now, I'm very interested in knowing whether we are more likely or more quickly to learn from a role model that is ourselves. So here's the scenario. You sit in your own presentation. So you sit in the audience and you see your own avatar giving this wonderful presentation. Or control group, you know, another avatar doing the same thing. And then we want to see next time you give a presentation, are you going to use more of these nonverbal behaviors because you sort of, you already saw it in your avatar. So it's sort of self-efficacy that might uh, kick in uh, to give you that. So that's a question that we're actually currently uh, studying. I don't have the answer to that, but I'm very interested in finding out. Another thing that we are currently studying is empathy. Can we use doppelgangers to increase empathy? Here is the scenario. As I think I mentioned before, one of the most stressful situations for a manager is when they have to fire a collaborator. Now imagine what happens when you have to fire yourself. And that's what we do. So people you know, have to fire their own avatar. And what we think is happening is that they take much more the perspective of themselves because they will think of what does that mean to me? What does that mean? How do I pay my rent? Where do my kids go to school and all of that? And again, control group would just be training with uh, firing another avatar. So next time, so it, well, we do that in the lab. Uh, when you have to fire another person, will your empathy increase? Why is that important? It's important for the person who gets fired for her or his mental health. But it's also important for the reputation of the company because um, the better that transition goes, the better then the person is going to talk about the company. So that's really important. So this is ongoing research. Um, next time I come, I can maybe uh, <laughs> talk about the results. So, um, before uh, we go to the question, answer, and the demo, just uh, sometimes I have this question, well, you're a psychologist and you train people in interpersonal skills, but why are you using machines? That sounds like a contradiction. And it is actually not for me for the simple reason that for me it's like uh, using a computer to write an email. So it's really a tool, uh, first and foremost, to train or to study. And as I mentioned before, at least the way those algorithms look to me act right now, today, we'll see in the future, I think we still need the human somewhere in the chain. We also need it, obviously, for, uh, for, for the development of the algorithm because we need some sort of ground truth in the social realm, and we can only have that from other social interaction partners. So, so the, 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 the algorithm is only going to uh, perform as good as the ground truth was that created it. So if, you know, the recruit are biased, then your algorithms will be exactly the same bias. So, so there's many things that we still need to tackle before, in my view, the computer can sort of uh, completely take over, and whether that should be the case or not, I think is also a question uh, of debating. So next time you are in Switzerland or in the Lausanne area, we'd be happy to welcome you and uh, show you our lab, but you have the opportunity to actually experience the fear of heights combined with the uh, fear of public speaking uh, in like about 10 minutes. So this is the official part of the talk, and I think we're going to go straight to question and answers, right? Yes. So let's thank Maria. Thank you. Uh, my question for, was for the research part of what you presented, yes. uh, and I was curious to what extent do you think the results 
uh, might be about the participants relationship to virtual reality yeah. rather than to the social circumstances yeah that's a great and question and that's something that you have explored yeah so that's a great question what we do uh, i mean you're right that people react differently to the technology and what we typically do is two things so one is that we try to measure you know how much experience they have with virtual reality setting how much with computer games and that kind of thing and sometimes we also code it directly from the video because you can actually relatively easily in a social interaction see whether whether they are in you know whether they are in the interaction or whether they are just sort of laughing it off. So we, we can code that uh, and then um, put that into the analysis finally. So, and that's usually what we do. So we control the results for, for that variable. Uh, it, usually it shows some relationship to the outcome, but since we're doing the experiments, what we are uh, interested typically is the relation between two variables that we either measure or manipulate. And for those, typically it actually, for that relationship, it usually doesn't affect it, but we can control for it, yeah. Well, the second thing that we usually do is we do some a little bit of a training so that everybody sort of is supposed to feel equally you know, comfortable in the setting. So this question is about the difference between the ideal behavior and the yeah. actual behavior yeah. of the participants. So have you done any work on control, non-control, in which non-control you have virtual reality or the vice versa, and the other place where you have human experts, and then find out actually the difference between the yeah. steps? Yeah, so, so I think two things that I want to mention. So there's sort of two ways you can do research on if you want to observe or measure or understand something about human uh, interpersonal behavior. Either you go out in the field and you put on a camera then, uh, which is less disturbing than inviting them to the lab, uh, which has other disadvantages because you have a lot, of, a lot of other variables you can't control. So I'm more, as you have gathered, the one that invites the people to the lab because we have more control conditions. Now, the other question is, are people... Um, is the behavior in the lab comparable to what they would do with a real person when they're interacting with the avatar? And I haven't really done that research, but other people have. So typically what comes out is that um, the, the behavior might, might be a little bit different, but sort of, again, the mechanisms are the same. i give you an example. So there is research showing that in interpersonal interactions, when, when I approach a person I don't know, and this person is looking at me directly, I will keep more distance than when the person is looking away. And that is exactly something that has been replicated in virtual reality. So it's probably not the really the, the meter distance that is the same, but it's sort of the same mechanism. And, and that has been shown that it actually works very well. Just an anecdote from the lab, 15 years of uh, doing experiments, and nobody ever has walked through an avatar, although you could. Uh, nobody has ever not reacted when an avatar walks towards you. So if the, if the interpersonal distance that is given in a culture is, uh, is violated, so people go away. And yeah, so that shows at least that they take the avatar as a represent, they treat it as a representation of a real human. Yeah, so how soon uh, do you think the skills which we learn in the virtual environment, uh, you don't start manifesting in the real world as well, uh, in terms of the timeline, how much do you really have to practice to, for it to really become a part of you in the real world? Yeah, so this is a question about the transfer from the, from the lab or for any training session. Yeah, so, so the literature shows, independent of the virtual reality part, that, uh, that that's a real problem. So people go, so, so companies spend huge amounts of money, obviously, in training, training of managerial leadership, social skills, what have you. And then people come back to the workplace and they can't always implement what they, what they learned. Now, there's a couple of variables that we know from research that are important for this transfer learning, which is one of the most important one is actually the support of the, 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 the hierarchy person up in terms of your, of your training. So if you come back and you say like, oh, I just learned that we should do it this way, 
but you don't have the support of your environment, you, you can't implement it. That's one of the key factors. And there's other factors which are related to personality traits and motivation to actually change. So this is things we know. And um, although there is not research directly done on the virtual reality, I think these are exactly the same factors that uh, influence. The other part maybe of your question is, is sort of, yeah, how long-term can the effects be, right? Um, which, again, the research is not very elaborate on that because typically it's sort of a one-shot training. And we are also thinking that we have a new research project funding for those questions uh, of the doppelganger that I just mentioned, and we were thinking of doing something more long-term, at least over, you know, people come back to the lab uh, over uh, a couple of months, actually. And I think that will give us much better results because we know from the therapy thing, which uh, typically has like five to seven sessions, and there, there's about a week or sometimes two weeks in between sessions. So they really do it in a more concentrated way than what we have done in research uh, currently. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to check two things. I know your work is primarily focused on, or uh, talk is focused on non-clinical populations. But when it comes to clinical populations, uh, how do people who, for example, had experience of hallucinations react to virtual reality? Is it different or is it the same? And the second thing would be about people with intellectual disorders or uh, intellectual disability or autism. Again, are the differences, difficulties in social interaction replicable in the virtual environment or is it again a little different for them? Yeah, so I'm really not a clinical psychologist, so I can't really answer that question. Um, the only thing that comes to mind also about the autistic, uh, autistic uh, spectrum disorder, uh, there are some applications for uh, autistic uh, uh, people, and, and I, I believe some of them show relatively positive results, but that's really all I can say. It's not my expertise. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so you presented one of the studies on role models, right? Yes. Yeah, so in that study, were you using the same subjects for each of the experiments or they were different? Yeah, so good question. So it's a between subjects design, which means it's different participants. Hmm. Yeah. So we don't get the repeated one because otherwise they're probably just going to figure out what we're after. Yeah, and uh, the topic... Uh, was same or was it different? Same topic. So, and then also everybody got to uh, prepare their talk. And we also gave them actually a list of arguments because we didn't want sort of intelligence differences or, or, or interest in the topic differences to play a role. Just a point to add to the point, the guy who was asked about people on the spectrum, how would they react to? So uh, we are an NGO, we work in the sector of... Uh, Autism, autism spectrum disorder, yes. and we have done a pilot of how VR works with people. So we are uh, right now using again to teach only social skills. We yes. want to try including, uh, you know, activities of daily living as well. Yeah. Uh, but we would like to seek your inputs on uh, how do we deal with people on the spectrum, since you yes. have a psychology background and you're working on VR. Yeah, is there definitely. any you know, points that you can add? Well, as I said, I'm really not a clinical psychologist, so, so my, my knowledge is limited here. Uh, maybe that's something, because it's very specific to your uh, interest, that we can talk afterwards, because I'm going to be outside, so that we can open up for maybe more global questions. Sure. Okay. So the avatars <laughs> that have been developed, yes. right, are developed by a certain set of developers. Can yes. I use that term? And they bring in certain ideas slash biases, exactly. positive and negative, yes. which also the avatars would carry yes. in their interactions. So how, w when you conduct this experiment and you're trying to map how people react, how do you sort of incorporate that into the design of your experiment? Yes. Right now, we don't because we just, use what is out there. And uh, uh, you have seen the collection, so it's sort of matched towards our, let's say the majority of our student population. But that's a big issue. So we're very unhappy with the current situation because we are, we are limited. We are not developing the avatar, so we are completely limited. So right now we are uh, developing a study where we look at stereotypes uh, against black people. 
And um, you know, we we are actually looking for for avatars with a, a darker skin and and so on. So so it's it's a whole issue of um, yeah of, of finding the right avatar. So we have a couple of similar ones. Sometimes we pretest them, so how they are perceived by the users, and try to use those. If we have a man and a female, for instance that are perceived equally uh, competent, equally likable, and, and stuff like that. So you can do that in pre-testing to ensure that they react. So, so, you know, on average, people react the same to, let's say, a female and a male. But we're very, very limited. And that's a big issue. So, so that's actually one of the reasons also we came here, because we want to collaborate uh, with developers to get better avatars. Because, well, you have understood that social interaction is important, so the quality and, and the features of the avatars are important too. This is the last question, and then uh, Marianne uh, would sort of inaugurate the virtual uh, reality, and then it keeps going, and then she goes out and answers more questions and discussions. So yeah. please go ahead, yeah, Sachin. How, how can I measure charisma? <laughs> That's a good question. So there is a, there is there is lots of literature out there, but there's essentially two aspects. So it's verbal charisma, and one of my colleagues has come up sort of with a list of things. So you can use metaphors, uh, stories, repetition. So there's a list of ten things. So you can just analyze the talk whether any of these were present. Uh, the other thing is that you can look at. Um, at nonverbal behavior. So for instance, eye contact is perceived as more charismatic, using uh, gestures is more charismatic. The way we did it in this study was very cheap. We asked outside observers on a scale from one to 10, how charismatic is this person during this talk? That's actually something that we use very often in psychology, these impressionistic kind of measures. And uh, they have good psychometric quality. So if you, you can't just ask one person, but ideally, let's say we ask the whole auditorium here, and uh, I give you 10 videos of different people talking, and every one of you uh, uh, writes down how charismatic they thought this person was it's going to converge to uh, something that shows us differences among the 10 um, presenters. So that's, that's how we did it. Sure okay, so, <laughs> so let's move on to the demo if uh, yes. Marianne so, agrees. And uh, mm -hmm. please welcome to ask uh, more questions, discussions. Uh, after this, she'll be outside and uh, feel free to ask questions. So let's just now uh, move on to the Next yeah. page. So uh, let's do it this way. I'm going to just demo what we do in the training to give you a little bit of a flavor. And then everybody who wants to try out the you just queue uh, up. Can I use you just as a demo? All right. So now you imagine that, um, <clears throat> that you have been in this workshop and we're um, now you have been working on a two minute speech. And um, I just let you put this on. Tell me whether it's not going to ruin your, hopefully, your hair. Shall I make it tighter? Yeah. All right. What do you see? Some people are sitting with. Yes, so you have sort of your audience, right, in front of you. So now uh, what, you, what I would like you to do is just two or three sentences, just present yourself to the audience. Hello everyone, I am Jhelum and I'm going to present a, a very short uh, sentence or some words for this uh, virtual reality uh, seminar. Uh, I came here uh, to just see the uh, collaboration of virtual reality and uh, this uh, psychology. I didn't have or imagined before uh, about these things, so I'm very much interested about uh, this uh, uh, this collaboration. Excellent, thank you. I'll just stop you there. So what I would do then in a training, I would now encourage you to try out new things because that's sort of the the, the idea. So when you say hello and you say your name, try to make a step forward toward the public and open up your arms. So try not to touch your hands. Uh, 
Yes, you don't see your hands, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll explain why. So just try, just one, one time, just one step forward. Okay, stop here. Just one more time, the first sentence when you talk to them. We're just going to repeat it. Stop. You have to go back a little bit. I just want you to do one step forward and open up your arm. Not now. When you start talking. So you say, hello, I am. Okay, okay let's try it. Hello, I am. Hello. <laughs> very good, very good. So different things happened. I don't know whether you saw it, but um, so she was talking a little bit more loudly and her smile, there was a smile in there. So that's sort of, now I would go on and we would try out other things. But I'm going to increase the challenge and, um, yeah, okay. and so on your right hand side, on the floor, do you see a yellow square? Can you put yourself in the middle of the yellow square? All right. Yeah, there's a, yeah, that's fine. Just ignore that. There's things going on in this. All right. So now uh, turn um, 90 degrees to your right. This way. Left. Yeah. And then you have a plank in front of you, right? Now, you, let's just look up to the ceiling. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, there is a plank over the void, but at the same time you sort of know that yeah. there is nothing. <laughs> Did you want to walk on the plank? You don't have to. Okay, I'm going to try. Maybe just one step. One more. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Don't worry. So what we would do, depending on, so people are very different. Some are more afraid of heights and some are less. So what we do now, are you okay here where you are on the platform? No. No? Okay. <laughs> So let's bring um, you down on the ground floor again. Yeah. All right, right? <laughs> and you can directly also see, so I think I'm going to take it off for you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Let me take it off for you. Thank you. So, uh, so what we do in training is really uh, uh, dependent on the level of anxiety of each person. So she is already stressed out enough, so her <laughs> adrenaline is uh, high. So she would be perfect now to work with and be more expressive even in your uh, presentation skills. And then some people do the next round of training on the plank. And then for those who are completely unimpressed by all the height thing, you can actually step in the void and you fall and virtually and then you have like this little bit of adrenaline coming up which again then liberates some uh, of the expressiveness with which we can work in the virtual reality all right so now uh, please queue up uh, we're not going to do the whole nonverbal stuff so we're just going to show you uh, sort of the pit you know so that you get the feel of how immersive this can be and I'm going to be outside for a question thank you so much yeah so so thank you, Marianne, for the talk and the demo and the demo continuing and the discussions going on and so on. But then we would like to really formally thank you for coming down and uh, sort of giving us this talk and showing us the demo and uh, uh, a honor from our oh. director. Yeah, to it's my pleasure, really. And thank you also so much for your question. Once again, thank you to our speaker, the director, Mr. Jagdish, CEO of Outreach, our deans, registrar, and faculty for supporting us. Thank you for coming and uh, making this event a success. Thank you.